So hi everyone and uh, welcome to this uh, new event with Open Your Morphic. Today we have George from Innaterra and uh, George is uh, currently a product architect in Innaterra, which is one of the shiny uh, neuromorphic startups. Uh, actually, they are building accelerator running SNNs and they are doing it uh, in a fully analog fashion, which is uh, a first in the neuromorphic world as far uh, as I know from, uh, from uh, apart from some other projects. And uh, George is working in Atera as a product architect, as I said, and uh, is the bridge between the software and the hardware uh, teams. He manages uh, both teams so, so that uh, no one uh, starts killing each other, I guess. And uh, apart from that, he got his PhD at the University College in Dublin at the Dynamical Systems and Risk Lab when uh, he worked on a really closely related co topic such as number Neumann computing paradigms. And uh, today, uh, George will, uh, will tell us more about Inatera and uh, about the product that they are building, which is their accelerator and how to run our SNNs on it. So George, I will leave it the floor to you. Perfect. Thank you very much. Thanks for that great introduction. Um, hi, everyone. I guess it's uh, different times of the day, so Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Um, yeah, so as uh, Fabrizio already introduced, we're in a Terra. Um, we build a new class of uh, processor called the spiking neural processor, which uh, does run spiking neural networks as well, which is why we are in this community now. And uh, I'd like to first introduce our company a bit, uh, very shortly, and then um, we can go into the thick of it. All right, so we are based in the Netherlands. We have a company that was spun out of TU Delft in 2018. Uh, right now, we have about 60 employees with offices in the Netherlands and India. And we are venture funded uh, from uh, some of the big names in this field, in the deep tech field. But you can see a current office in Weisswijk, uh, which is very close to Delft in the Netherlands, and where, where we started off in TU Delft. Um, a bit about myself. Um, as as um, Patricia was saying, I'm, uh, I'm in the architecture team in our company. So uh, it's not just me, but uh, me and uh, some of my colleagues together. Uh, try to define the software and hardware architecture uh, for our product. Um, I think it's also, uh, since we are in this community of uh, neural network uh, SNN enthusiasts, uh, I'd like to say also a short word of how I got here, because um, as you can, as you heard, I was in dynamical systems and trying to do something with a couple of oscillators and uh, studying a phenomenon called synchronization. And there was quite a bit of literature about synchronization in the brain and how that helps keep timing and do certain kinds of processing. And this was roughly around the time when Loi He was coming out from Intel. And uh, I got into that and started looking at how uh, computing using neurons could work. And uh, that's that sort of segued into um, yeah, getting into SNNs full time. So that's that's one of the great things about, I think, this field of spiking neural networks that people from a wide variety of fields might have some kind of um, input towards uh, the, some kind of contribution that they can do in this field. All right, back to Inotera, what we do. Um, so we are a company that we position our product very close to the sensor. So if you look at this slide, you can see that the, roughly speaking, the, the different classes of uh, compute or processing hardware that um, are available for different kinds of tasks, all the way from um, hundreds of watts and data center class uh, machines down to your typical accelerators uh, and GPUs and uh, custom compute for neural networks and uh, coming all the way down to the sensor. 
And we try to sit really close to the sensor or we are positioning our uh, chip as the single um, solution, the single um, SOC that a sensor would talk to uh, so that you don't have to have um, another chip on there. So this is probably where we position ourselves or see ourselves. And this means we can we can operate on a really small power budget in the milliwatt or really sub milliwatt power budget. Try to condition condition data, um, maybe identify some basic patterns, do come do some uh, data complexity reduction or dimensionality reduction, and even control the sensor with required. So that's that's where we are. So from a high level, uh, again to summarize, we work with all kinds of uh, sensor data, temporal sensor data, time series data, coming from all kinds of sensors, um, like radar, microphones, any kind of uh, biomedical sensors you can think of. And our processor talks directly to the sensor and tries to identify patterns or do some signal, basic signal processing on it, data fusion on it. This is really what our uh, core product is. By the way, I, I'd like to keep the um, talk as interactive as possible if we can do that. Um, feel free to ask questions as I go along. You don't have to keep it to for the end of the talk. Yeah, so for this community, I guess there's no need for an introduction of how spiking neural networks work and all that. I'm just including this for the sake of completeness. But yeah, the idea is that you take input data and then you encode them into spikes, try to uh, do some processing with uh, uh, a spiking neural network, and then decode those spikes into something meaningful. Um, yeah. So again, to reiterate, throughout the throughout this talk, I'm I'm going to make a few assumptions on um, what everyone knows. I think it's uh, since it's an open neuromorphic community, I think it's fair to assume what uh, a lift neuron is or uh, what spike encoding would be or Poisson encoding or something like that. But if I, if there's anything that needs further clarification, just uh, well, you can stop me and I can expand. All right. So coming to our architecture, the spike neural processor architecture, we have a family of uh, varying, slightly varying architectures, but this is roughly uh, the high level architecture covering all of them. We have uh, standard sensor interfaces, um, and we have a encoder or a bunch of encoders that you can convert um, the, to convert the spikes into data. We have a, a CPU for some kind of housekeeping, and then a analog uh, spiking neuron array. So it's uh, so we would call our chip mixed signal rather than pure analog in that sense. Um, but yeah, and this is a highly parallel fabric. You can have multiple networks mapped. You can have parallel uh, network, parallel running of different networks. And this can also be scaled down or up depending on uh, the use case in hand, the kind of data purpose you want, all that. And since it's analog, uh, we, we, can, we can operate at a really, really low uh, power budget and uh, also allow really low latency uh, for end-to-end -end for applications. Okay. So when we talk about uh, KPIs for embedded AI, which is the space that we are in, as I showed you, we are uh, towards the left close to the sensor, and this is where the embedded AI uh, well, typically, yes. And people talk uh, quite a bit about power, performance, and area. Performance being a catch-all for 
um, I don't know, accuracy or um, let's say latency or any other metric that might be specific to the application. And PPA is the, you know, typically the quantified metrics for um, an application. Um, but it, an, an unspoken KPI, so to speak, is the programmability or the ease of use of the entire stack, entire technology stack. Um, to actually deliver the, um, uh, to actually deploy the embedded solution. So it's uh, this is somewhat hard to quantify. How do you how do you say that uh, a certain software stack is easy to use, or you can go from uh, prototyping something to actually deploying it on on chip? So this this part is. Uh, sometimes not appreciated well enough. And I'd like to really focus on the programmability and what the ease of use and what it really takes to go from just neural network building to, to actually developing a, a full-fledged embedded application and deploying it on chip. Uh, and what are the tools required to do that? Um, yeah. I might even go as far as saying that um, it's generally in the neuromorphic community when I'm talking to researchers and um, anybody from the academic field, there's sometimes uh, this discussion about what would be the killer application, the killer app, so to speak, in panel discussions of uh, how neuromorphic computing might see mass adoption. But I might, um, I, this is my opinion, not my company's opinion, but my opinion would be that the programmability is the uh, single issue that is maybe holding us back. The, we have customers actually coming out, coming up with uh, real use cases uh, which have a clear power performance and area numbers that you can target. Um, so it's it, the killer app is already here. It's not that neuromorphic computing cannot go mainstream now. It's the programmability solution that uh, that really needs uh, addressing. And yeah, so let's let's talk about uh, programmability. So our stack of tools, a uh, collection of tools that we uh, put together to make this as seamless as possible for uh, uh, users is called uh, Taramo, it's our SDK. So Talamo is a, is a collection of different uh, components. It's, uh, so the network building and training might be the most obvious one. And a lot, there's quite a few different packages out there, open source as well, that does network building and training. And it's, uh, it's not significantly different from those we are PyTorch based and we can do standard network building and training. But it's, uh, Everything else in this uh, slide that really makes Talamu, uh, uh, let's say, a complete uh, product, which is uh, you can you can build an entire pipeline. So it's not just a network. If you have to, if you have, if you have a, let's say, a audio company making a, a, a some kind of hearable, say, uh, an in in ear ear pod or something like that, and if you have um, custom proprietary filters uh, that you want to include in your pipeline, and you want to, you don't necessarily want to expose them um, to your uh, to whoever is developing a SNN. Uh, can we build a pipeline including those kind of blocks? Uh, we we create we have tools to put together any kind of pipeline in that sense. And we also have tools to compile down the, the these pipelines, lower it to deploy on our architectures to different kinds of chips. And if we do not want to run it on hardware, but instead run it on a simulator that uh, simulates the hardware, then we have simulation tools to do that. Um, we also have um, so once you actually start developing something in a in a production scale, you also need to do versioning, tracking, hyperparameter hyper tuning, all those. And for that, you typically would have MLOps tooling, and you need to interface with that. So uh, 
the ability to do that is also baked in uh, into Tavamo. Oh, we provide we create APIs to do that. And topology zoo or uh, a, a more expanded version would be a model zoo. So um, if you imagine a, 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 an embedded AI developer who is coming to SNNs for the first time, uh, you may it might not be reasonable to expect them to know what parameters to set up for neurons, synapses, things like that. So we we create a set of um, networks that can be picked up directly, and you can go. Uh, you can start off immediately and hit the ground running with potentially uh, a, a, a model and create data sets and encode them and put it into put it into the models without having to go through the process of figuring out how to create a network and what the right parameters might look like. So this is an topology zoo. And finally, we come to embedded deployment. Um, this is a set of interfaces to essentially uh, find, do the final embedded uh, deployment. This might even mean, for example, that you need multiple pipelines uh, configured on a chip. You might have triggers. Uh, for example, if one pipeline fails, fall back to another pipeline to all kinds of deployment. That's a and also guardrails if if your end application, uh, for example, in the in an automotive space or uh, any other space which requires guardrails, um, conditions of uh, failure and all that, uh, uh, ability to do that needs to also exist. And for this, we create interfaces in the embedded deployment piece. So this is the this is the summary of what the Talamo SDK is. <clears throat> So there's usually a focus on the, let's say the uh, Pytos bits of it, the, the network bits of it. And uh, this is just to highlight that all of that is uh, a given. We have ability to uh, create networks, create different kinds of neurons, synapses, abstract them into layers, uh, have the, do training using different kinds of surrogate variants. All that is uh, available by default, and it interfaces with all the other components of the SDK as well. I hope I gave you a high-level overview of uh, what our SDK is all about. And what I'll do now is uh, go a bit deeper into what all of this looks like in, in code, and then we can uh, hopefully take questions as we go. Right. And you see my screen? Yes. You do, yeah. Right. So this is uh, I'm on the S code. Hope people can see this. Yes, yes, it's showing up. All right. Many people will hate you for your light-based theme, but that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> I I don't, eh, but <laughs> no worry, what it's going fine. Yeah, we're still during the day here, sun. The sun hasn't set completely. <laughs> All right, so okay, so if let's let's go from um, you know the the lowest complexity of the, um, this, if somebody was new to SNNs and wanted to quickly get the ground running, how would they uh, start off from? And uh, from there, we can slowly build up. Um, so, yeah, as I said, if you have an embedded developer who is just starting off, then uh, what you would do is just pick up something from the topology zoo. Um, for example, we have a feed forward to layer uh, network. And you can get that. Yeah, let me just import the Lamo as well. Yeah. So now, if, if I wanted to just create a model 
called feed forward to layer uh, with a certain number of inputs, let's say 16, and outputs, let's say 10. This is as simple as one line, and you're done. So this is now a, a model of uh, two layers with uh, default uh, defaults for neurons, synapses, everything already preset. And this model can be used in a in a training pipeline if you want. So this is the, just the, a question. Just a question because I see some modules here, like are there neuron, are there synapse? I suppose yeah. that uh, this is directly quant uh, as you train your network, maybe it's directly quantized in some way. So uh, it's not quantized, but the hardware neuron and hardware synapse sets a certain, uh, certain defaults. Okay. Maybe we lost George. Can you hear me? Yeah, my. <laughs> no, on the notebook. <laughs> uh, okay, okay, we will. Uh, it's, uh, it will recover very really fast for sure. And uh, okay, let's wait uh, a little bit. So. Hmm. Okay, I was curious because I saw all these uh, fancy. Okay, he logged out. No. Okay, I saw a memory capacitance. We're a bit uh, unlucky <laughs> the, these days. <laughs> At least uh, today there will be no zoom booming. Yeah, exactly. At least that I cannot I work. It. Exactly. Start drawing. Uh, <laughs> Start drawing transformers on the uh, on the whiteboard. <laughs> okay, what is the pressure? No, we just also got our first uh, questions. Okay, we'll answer eventually. Uh, in the meantime, I monitor here. So let's see. I'm monitoring Zoom. Oh, yeah, yeah. When I saw those uh, that membrane capacitance, uh, one pico farad, uh, I saw that uh, it's an analog array. Maybe I was really curious to know if that was an analog parameter or not. But he's doing uh, the live coding uh, in real time. I mean, respect. Uh, respect I hope for that. that is. <laughs> oh, here it is. I hope that he has some reference because that will be really bold. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, should be back Welcome in the back, meeting. George. Uh, sorry Hi, George. about that. Somehow... No worries. <laughs> no uh... worries. There is always something going wrong in our events. So <laughs> that's not you. That's on us. It's part of it. <laughs> uh, this is unfortunate. I'll just uh, okay. set up the environment again. Yeah, 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 sure. No worries. In the meantime... Uh, if uh, you want, there are a couple of questions. In the meantime, if you want, or do you want me to wait uh, for you to set up everything? Uh, they are not on the code, they are on the company. Yeah, I'll, uh, just give me a second, I'll just set this okay, up. Okay, okay. <laughs> now YouTube is admiring my beautiful haircut. Why she said that? Yes, that's what he does to people. I'm sorry, guys. Now I am. Uh, <coughs> Jason convinced me to go to the US, and we are joining the Marines together. Um, yes. That's it. We are going to bring a democracy all around the world together. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I didn't hear what you said, but probably you insulted me from the deep of your soul. All right. I think, um, okay. Up. Um, Let me see if, okay. Screen sharing should be enabled. Of fine. course, uh, we have uh, plenty of time, so don't worry if uh, we go a little uh, bit over time or a lot over time. So we have plenty of time.
Okay, we can see your uh, VS Code now. Okay, good. Back as it was. Right, so now let us make sure. Yeah. yeah, I can take the questions. Okay, there were a couple of questions. Uh, <clears throat> uh, apart from someone that is saying that you're really beautiful, there is a... Uh, and a question, could you talk at all about Inatera's choice of analog design versus digital for the hardware and what challenges you have encountered? Uh, for instance, Yeld consists of uh, consistency of memory stores, but I don't think that your chip is memory still, right? It's CMOS based. Uh, sure, yeah. Um, the, yeah, we are not using um, memory state technologies at the moment. Okay, uh, so the, the rest is, uh, the rest of the question is, why did you go for analog basically and not digital? And what challenges uh, did you encounter if you can talk about it or not? Uh, and uh, that's the first question. Yeah, I can I can briefly talk about it. I, uh, there's quite a lot to talk about Telamo as well, but um, I think, so mm, I think the, Benefits of SNNs really uh, shine when you can do them as analog. Or well, actually, let me put it the other way. Um, all the advantage that we get with this power advantage and all this, uh, about pretty much the bulk of it is coming from uh, us being analog by going analog. Uh, the way that I see it is that. Um, SNNs are basically the best thing to happen to analog. So analog uh, computing has its advantages where you can um, have a really high dynamic range and do really low power computing and all that. But at the same time, you have to handle uh, variability and all that. Uh, but then when you, in, when you have SNNs, uh, you can fine tune the level of, let's say, uh, digitization you want for that analog signal processing chains. You can have uh, spikes happening as often or um, as sparsely as you want. And you're somewhat um, having the best of both worlds. So you have all the power benefits and dynamic range benefits and everything that come from analog, but also the, the precision if required and the reliability and robustness of digital by having SNNs. So analog plus SNN is a, a really powerful combination in that sense. Um, but at the same time, we are not, um, as I said, we are mixed signal, right? So we have the ability to, to run things as flexibly as we want, how, how analog we want to be or how digital we want to be, we can skew it in certain ways. Our architecture allows us to um, yeah, fine tune that. Okay. Thanks. And uh, the other question was, uh, which is the precision of the weights uh, that you can deploy to your chip? So how many bits, uh, I suppose, yeah, if we so, are talking about bits at all? Um, again, uh, this is now going deeper into the hardware architecture. Um, it, it, we, we, so minus 31 to 31, so 5 bits to sign, 6 bits is typically where our architecture is, but we, um, this is the one that we are sampling. We have a, a class of chips and uh, with slightly different quantization levels. Okay. And uh, let me check if you have anything else. Uh, mm. Okay. There is a following from Alessandro's question. Could you give some background into the analog hardware implementation? A brief word about the kind of blocks that the NN architecture is translated into, but maybe we can go a little bit uh, forward on the code and then we can get back to this because it's still hardware related. Otherwise, we will uh, lose the flow of. Uh, the Let's talk hardware. about the hardware yeah. a bit uh, later. Yeah. 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 That's okay. So we are okay. coming back from you, Ryan. Don't yeah. worry. Right. So coming back here, yeah, as I was saying, the, it's Alamo is designed so that um, the usability versus flexibility, ease of use versus flexibility curve um, is always um, sort of 
you know, uh, at the extreme of the ease of use um, while going from a junior, uh, let's say, um, neuromorph, uh, somebody who is uh, new to neuromorphic, but also as they require more flexibility to keep it um, as flexible as possible. So if we have a feed forward layer like this, and so I'm, I'm planning to first do just a standard uh, drosophilia test, you could say MNIST, and then go to a more complicated uh, example. So if I were to create a, a data set, something like you can get some thoughts vision. We base that. Yeah, so this is your MNIST plane. And test. Okay. All right, so that's your data sets done. And you can just uh, package them into a tensor data set. Have some code that does that. Again, this is PyTorch based, so we can include Torch. I'm just picking the first 5,000 at the moment. And by this time, then you can essentially see where I'm going. You can play in a simple. Uh, so until now, you can see that I've not even talked about uh, any kind of neurons or anything like that. Uh, now I can I can directly take my mm, model if I wanted to. So yeah, at this point, there is a, uh, let's say a new introduction to be made, which is the time step. So um, our, um, yeah, uh, the PyTOS extension is built in a way that regardless of um, the discretization that you want, it can automatically do that. So it, you can, if you have data coming in at a, at a certain sampling rate uh, for a time series, there's no requirement that your networks need to be uh, simulated at the same time step or something. You can have a, a, a subsampling or resampling done by the tool uh, if required. Let's say we set something like one microsecond. And then we can just set a time step. All right. So that is done. Then your standard training. I don't need to introduce anyone to any of this. Okay. Um, all right, so we have our data sets created and data loaders created. We have our model created. We have our optimizers and loss function and scheduler just for completeness sake all created. And now we can just uh, uh, define our um, training loop, uh, but obviously you know that uh, the step that's missing now is the encoding stage. So how do we encode? For that we create an encoder. Ramo comes with batteries included. So uh, create a Poisson encoder, for example, and you can specify your uh, uh, fmin, fmax, and how long you want to have the data encoded for. Now this works because MNIST is uh, uh, just uh, images and single values. 
And we also need a decoder. So let's say this is the encoder. We need a decoder for the output coming out from the assonance. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay, so to, just to clarify right now, you are encoding just using a naive uh, Poisson write encoder, the pixels, and then yes. you are using a rate coding uh, to decode the classified task, uh, sorry, yeah. class, right? Yeah. Okay, yeah. just, uh, and the uh, frequency minimum, those are hertz by any chance. Yeah. So uh, five kilohertz. Are... Yeah, 200 kilohertz. Okay. Four hundred kilohertz. Okay, okay, okay. Uh, and the maximum duration uh, T max stands for T max for how long the the spikes are to be encoded for. Okay, okay. Thank you. Yeah. So I since we are doing this live, I might also add a subsampling to the MNIST to keep things small. So this is just uh, me doing a subsampling. And uh, so I'm cutting out the borders of the images and also subsampling it by three to reduce the dimensionality. So that would mean subsample. Okay. okay, so at this point, you can maybe we can just take a look at what the frame um, data shape looks like. Um, which one did I? Yeah, so we have 192 as the, as the shape going from 784 all the way down to 192. Okay, so that means we would need our feed forward model to have 192, you can see why I set it as 192 and the output size is 10. Uh, the auto resolve is not important. Uh, it basically is, again, speaking of those guardrails, depending on uh, whether you want things to uh, uh, go through, the, whether depending on whether it's supported on hardware or not, uh, you, can, you can turn on some guardrails on or off. In this case, it adjusts uh, the hidden layer size to 96, but with the default is 128 um, to, to make it fit for a certain class of hardware. Okay, so we have bundled a bunch of things. Uh, uh, sorry, sorry, George, they are just yeah. asking uh, uh, from the chat if you could just enlarge the uh the font and if you can turn on a dark mode but the second <laughs> it's your choice <laughs> yeah, just yeah, enlarge the font it's okay i can do both um cannot see so the zoom thing is coming how do i move that can i move the yeah so when screen sharing zoom is showing a a, like a dashboard, which I have to. Um, right, that should make things a bit bigger. Mm -hmm. And people want. Sorry. They took me seriously at the beginning. <laughs> uh, let's do evil light dark. Oh, oh. Okay. Okay. Now you are back in the community graces. <laughs> yeah, that's cool. <laughs> okay. 
Yeah, so now we basically have a, a couple of helper functions to uh, train, train and do checkpoint saving and things like that. So I'll just uh, copy paste it here and then walk you through it. So we can create a directory for saving things and logging things and uh, create callback functions to do uh, checkpoint saving. And we allow visualization using TensorBoard, uh, which can be again accessed uh, through the helper function. So for that, this callback is created. We set the number of epochs to run things for. And then the spikes itself are created by doing a call of the encoder. And you can then package that into a, a data loader for the encoded spikes. And finally, we have a, a, a nice helper function to do uh, all the uh, training back propagation through time. Um, this it's not necessarily to use this function. You can write your own you know, training loop if required, but this package is quite a lot of things. Again, this is uh, meant to be in, designed in a, such a way that uh, somebody who is really new to SNNs can pick it up and directly get the ground run. Okay, so once all of this is done, um, we're basically uh, ready to. Uh, Plain something. So this I'm on a CPU, but uh, um, we have GPU support as well because this is just um, standard PyTorch. Uh, so it will run the data set, the, the training loop, as you can see, and yeah, slowly build up the accuracy. So this is our uh, essentially the the basic uh, you could say the uh, the basic flow but we don't have to stick to this kind of a uh, just uh, sorry George I think you might maybe did you miss um something like maybe you didn't execute a cell or something do you may maybe you want to try because it's not learning maybe you want to try uh, restarting the notebook executing all cells or something like that maybe you missed one of the cells or something like that uh sure we can try that it's also one thing uh, that seems off <laughs> And also a quick question here. Um, so if I, I mean, you show this um, training loop uh, that does everything. If I wanted to you do my own PyTorch um, training loop, like, can I use the model? Will it behave like a PyTorch? Oh, there you go. Uh, yeah. will, it, will it behave like a PyTorch um, standard model? Um, or is there, you know, can I get, is the API the same is my question. Uh, I don't know, a model.parameters, does it give me a list parameters, yeah. model.children and so on? Yeah. Essentially, okay. yes. So I can um, I can show that uh, once the, maybe after running it for a few epochs. Great. Thanks. One thing which, which cell I missed, or maybe I didn't initialize something. Yeah. It seems to be learning right now because it was 60%. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah, more or less it's something that maybe it's also have, due to the aggressive uh, subsem because also as you said um uh does the chip have a name or it's talamo just the sdk talamo is the sdk um okay. for chips we, we internally go by uh code names b0 c0 etc <laughs> okay. Uh, anyway, the chip is a is meant to be used in uh, low dimensionality applications, right? Also for that. Uh, low, low input to dimensionality. I meant low input dimensionality. Yeah, you could say that. So um not not high dimensional vision in that sense. Um uh, you could say. Okay. Yeah. 
Okay, okay, just uh, because I wanted that. And uh, and this uh, is uh, your uh, and the SDK will be provided. Uh, uh, is what I meant is will the SDK, for instance, be open source or will uh, I don't know, Captain? Uh, right now it's, it's it's meant to be given a, a, alongside the the hardware platform, so it's really okay. a bundle. Um, the, yeah, that's that's basically the situation at the moment. Again, so when when talking about the SDK today, my objective here is not to uh, talk about how great our SDK is. It's to really use, um, let's showcase our our design, our philosophy of mm -hmm. putting together all these tools, so that we can uh, we can as a community talk about what it needs, what needs to happen to go from tools that can just build a network and train them to uh, to the full pipeline and uh, deploying it and all that. Okay, okay, thanks. Yeah, no problem. And yeah, for, for named parameters, uh, those things are as you would expect. Um, these are all standard torch modules. So you were asking, like, okay. if you wanted to, uh, if you wanted to run, uh, um, so instead of uh, training, if you wanted to run testing, and we have some helper functions to do that as well. Um, but actually go one step higher. Okay, I'll just uh, do an evaluate anyway. So this is test performance. We are now encoding the test data creating a spike data set and doing an evaluation of that. Now, if you wanted to also send this model to be evaluated, so this is pure PyTOS, right? This is still pure PyTOS, but if you wanted to run it in a, a, a simulator, the hardware simulator, you can also do that. At that point, you would be invoking a, a mapper uh, that is specific to that architecture, uh, setting a simulation target. Uh, this is our architectural simulator and it can take uh, uh, different targets. And then you can evaluate the model over there. So another question, uh, once, uh, for instance, if I am a customer and I will get the development board, I, I suppose with the ship and the SDK, is it possible to perform uh, training in the loop? Not, not the whole training maybe, but fine tuning in the loop, for instance? Sure, yeah. This is, uh, okay. I, I hopefully I can show, um, Okay, maybe not uh, training in the loop, but uh, some APIs oh. that we have developed mm -hmm. for hyperparameter tuning and uh, the parallelization of it. No, I for instance, what I meant, uh, since you have this analog accelerator, just to be sure that there is a one to one correspond, more or less one to one correspondence, uh, if there, is, there can be some, a couple of epochs just to fine tune the parameters for your chip and so on and so forth. Yeah, this is possible, but we right. we uh, designed it in a way our entire tooling is done in a way that you don't have to do that. Um, okay. So we have calibration mechanisms in place that guarantee a certain uh, confidence to your simulations and software. Okay, very okay. Really nice. Yeah, so this is taking a bit of time because it's uh, it's running um, essentially a hardware model and uh, trying to okay. Out. So basically now you are using a software layer to emulate inference on the chip directly, for instance, yeah. but on your workstation. It's, it's, okay. it's a simulator, it's a, it's a simulator of okay. the hardware architecture, including the, uh, the communication, uh, the interconnect design and everything on that. Okay, really, really nice. So that's why it is it is taking a little bit of time. Okay, okay. Uh, yeah. So okay. while we are there, I might as well just uh, 
also create a, a plot, have some plotting tools. Yes. So if we wanted to do quantization, we can do that as well. I'm just create, I'll show you the quantization. Okay. Fastest score rider I've ever met. What? Uh, no, I was joking. Fastest uh, <laughs> code rider I've ever met. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm just, uh, <laughs> flying to the keyboard mm. like flash. Okay. Bye. No, it's almost done. Okay, so what I'm going to now do is try and create some plots of. In the meantime, there is uh, there is okay. a question from the audience. Uh, they are asking if there uh, which are the available learning rules in Talamo. If, for instance, you can choose uh, surrogate different surrogate gradient descent uh, uh, estimators. Uh, or uh, if there are other rules uh, that you can use to train your networks directly built into Talamo beyond the backprop. Uh, right now it's it's uh, it's just backprop, but yeah. and the uh, surrogate gradients itself we offer a few options. And if you want to define your own surrogate gradient, this is also fine. It's just um, it's just a um, yeah. Uh, autograd, you just you can just subclass an autograd function and uh, you can define your own back backward and forward. Uh, okay, because I saw that uh, for, uh, the default is a fast sigmoid. Or I saw a fast sigmoid argument somewhere, and the, yes. I suppose you support uh, something also like Arcodanch and then so on and so forth. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Now, um, again, that's another thing. So I went through the flow of just creating a model of this sort. Mm -hmm. But if you were somebody who wanted to create a, a custom network, or uh, even okay. even starting from here, if you want uh, from the, um, so if you wanted to create a model uh, with a different so in this case, I created this uh, with a, so now you can define. A different synapse uh, if you okay. want. So import Financial DK synapse, and then if you want to set up a different time constant, this is uh Let's say but so again, this is the how the layering of uh, complexity is allowed. So if you're a beginner, you don't have to know all of this. But if you're somebody who really wants access to uh, more stuff, then this is also facilitated. So if you want okay. to set up your own uh, neuron, and uh, this needs to be a lift neuron with a certain so again, the defaults, but if you want a specific firing threshold, uh, if you want to have a specific uh, time constant there as well, all of this is again possible. And for the new one, if you want to set up a, you want to set up a gradient, uh, Yeah, it's G. So it comes with a, a default scale, but if you want to set, no, the documentation is not showing. Yeah, if you want to set up a different uh, scaling argument or something like that, this is also possible. So this kind of definition is definitely possible. Um, but also, um, maybe we shouldn't see a short of time. I'd, I'm not creating a network myself, but I can show you how it looks like. Uh, so if we wanted to create a feedforward layer, uh, this mm -hmm. is 
essentially how you would create it. You have a layer defined like this with the input size and output size. You have a, essentially a dense layer and uh, you can specify the default setup for the synapse model, neural model, and initializers for the weight. But you can define your own model using these building blocks as well. Okay. Okay. Right. So this, so as you as you advance in going from a ML engineer to learning about SNNs, all this flexibility comes into play, and you can use all that and uh, still keep working with your standard PyTorch flow. Uh, let's see if I can plot something. Um, yeah. All right, so this is currently the uh, input and output weights. We could also do some kind of quantization if required. Uh, for example, oops, why? So we create a quantizer. Um, let's go for round and plan. So this just rounds it and sets it up a, to a value. So as I was saying, one of our architectures uses six bits. So that's minus 31 to 31 or minus 32 to 31, but let's go with that. And now if I run the call the quantizer on the model, um, it quantizes it. And I have a bit of code available to just extract the weights. George, what is the size of the network that fits on your chip? How many parameters can I expect to fit in onto your chip uh, realistically? Yeah, so this is a tricky question to answer because it's not. Um, that's simple because we have a really uh, parallel architecture and depending on how you uh, design your network, uh, the parameter range can vary quite a bit. Um, but I think it's reasonable to think of it in um, less than 100,000 as the of range of parameters typically. Yeah, so we're thinking about models in that size. Tens of thousands is maybe where we'd have a sweet spot for uh, standard applications. Thank you. Yeah, so you get the, your contest rates and the normal rates. Okay, so it took quite a bit of time, but all of this is, almost uh, standard now, right? There's quite a few uh, packages, open source as well, that do all of this. So this is the bare minimum threshold in, uh, you have to cost to be an SDK that can do Spike manual network development. And I just wanted to get through that to uh, show that, okay, this is something that we can do. Now, if you're a researcher or even within our own team, we have, we have an algorithms team and, a lot of their work might be experimenting with different kinds of neural networks, um, learning rules, can you encoders and all that. And this is uh, this is primarily targeted uh, to that kind of workflow. But from here, now, if you want to actually start building a real application, uh, you would need to go for a bit more complicated or complex uh, pipeline. Right. Because anyone who's tried developing an actual application knows that you, you don't typically have this straightforward flow like MNIST, right? You would need to do quite a, a few iterations on different parts of the pipeline. So 
what I'll do is I'll show you how we enable pipeline building, how we can take each of those steps that I already described and uh, put it into classes, objects that you can then build the pipeline out of. So our, our typical pipeline uh, block, let's say, uh, looks like this. So if you have a, um, let's say, processing block, it will have a connect. and a call right? so this is how you would write your pipeline blocks i'm going to create a right now i'm going to go a bit faster but i hope that's okay it's just that the the conceptual building blocks are sufficient to convey but we can, you can stop me at any point. I'm going to create a, 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 a block that can load, load audio files and put it here. So just to expand a bit, uh, there's a bit of protection for typing and all that, but usually so this, this example was also developed by one of our Engineers, Paris, and he's uh, quite particular about doing proper typing uh, in Python. So you get all that. Right. So what it does is it takes uh, wave files from a direct way. I'm going to develop a scene classification uh, example from a, a set of files from uh, a, a data set called DCase 2020. So this a uh, particular class is going to load those files and then uh, create a uh, yeah, data set out of it. It's going to use Librosa to do that. So that's a one pipeline block defined. Now, um, the, uh, the next pipeline block is going to be, okay, just to again talk about pipelines, you have something called load audio, then you might have to do some feature extraction. Uh, this might involve additional steps as well, like uh, normalization, mean, anything else that you might want to do. And there's your spike encoding, then your Network. This is your um, typical pipeline, right? For the data. And then you'll have a block on top of it doing the training. In order to do that, we'll define each of these pipeline blocks. I'm going to create a This is a feature of extraction uh, block, which uh, is, is going to do MFCC. If you're not familiar with MFCC, this is a standard uh, feature of extraction method in audio. It takes a, a FFT and then uh, does a log binning of it and does a DCT on top of it, a discrete cosine transform on top of it. And we're not going to invent uh, reinvent the wheel. We're just going to use a package called Librosa, which already has a MLSpec program built in, and use that to compute the MFCC. So a point to note here is that um, I've just wrapped around a, another package over here, right? So whatever kind of um, package that you might have already pre-built and want to include in your pipeline uh, to, uh, along with an SNN, you can do that using this kind of uh, API. That's created. And I have a step to take a mean of that. So here, what you're doing is 
taking a mean of that and creating a, a single vector cross time. There's a normalization stage. I thought I didn't have enough content for one hour. I think what I'll be going for quite a bit longer. I hope that's okay. <laughs> It's totally fine, don't worry. <laughs> and some access scaling. Again, the details here don't matter, but we can come back. And a network. So here, I'm going to define a network. Um, I'm also, yeah, this is your, like a, a full-fledged network. This is realistically how you're, uh, so right now we're not using the, standard topology zoo or anything. you're creating your network yourself and I'm also going to uh, create a mapper and send it to a, an actual device sitting somewhere. All right, so we've defined everything until a network. Now we need a, a block that can do twining. So we have a train pipeline, a train block for the pipeline. So this is all your boilerplate for training. So you have your optimizer, uh, your learning rate, your loss function, and the black hole full time. An evaluate block to do that. Okay, so at this stage, we are ready to actually create the pipelines. Um, so also to facilitate the um, setting up different, so what I'm going to do is extract, show you this, why about this? Uh, Give me a second. Yeah. So what you can do is you can set up the, uh, essentially the different kinds of uh, hyperparameters that you want to use in each of these different blocks. And those can be then passed on to, let's say, uh, hyperparameter tuning package. And you can set up an entire flow uh, going through the pipeline again and again, if you want to. So yeah, you can you can set it up like this, but if you want to run it inside your Python script, that's perfectly fine. You don't have to extract it from um, a YAML file like this. All right, so here I'm extracting the params from file. And this is, Essentially how we set up a pipeline, we say this is the parameters and the steps are going to look like this. The feature extraction, the feature mean, and the access scaling, planning, evaluation. And in all of this, we uh, initialize the, the parameters given inside the params file uh, with that block. Okay, so now we've built our pipeline. The argument that never run on chip, it's really fun. <laughs> uh, uh, the third, the last call on never run. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that's another, that's okay. I, that's a nice segue to also, um, we, so depending on how, uh, how you want to test your pipeline, if you want to have a um, hybrid pipeline where some, of, some blocks are running on CPU, some are running on chip uh, and then coming back and then running on CPU, going back. All this can, uh, can also be done. So you can set it up to run on chip. Uh, forget. So each of, depending on whether uh, that block has been, um, you know, implemented for uh, an implementation is available for the chip. Uh, you can, uh, you can build out your pipeline and, uh, that fashion and run different bits in different places, different targets. Okay. So, George, on this, on that note, like 
um, so now we looked at the uh, simulation, like we, we have the, our spikes and uh, we have time steps that going through activations uh, over time. Can you walk us through what happens actually on the chip when we load weights and, and perform um, the computation on the mixed signal chip? Um, I guess there's some ADC involved and like, uh, can you just walk us through that as well? Yeah, so in in this kind of workflow where we are trying to um, prototype an end-to-end -end application, um, you would typically do a, a lot of the digital stuff. Let's say the, the feature extraction, the normalization, the encoding and all that, you can do it on um, your CPU side, your PC side, essentially, if you are just trying to prototype things. And then it's possible to just send spikes to the chip and get spikes out. And this would be a typical workflow. When you want to have a fully embedded application, then you can have uh, embedded um, implementations of um, your, let's say, uh, if, if you require any kind of um, feature extraction or something, it doesn't necessarily need to be present, but you can. You can also send data directly to an encoder on chip and allow the whole flow to happen like that. The spikes communicating, uh, the spikes that you communicate to and from the chip in that sense would be digital. Um, but uh, we don't necessarily have uh, multi-bit ABCs in that flow. We, um, we have a, uh, a way of keeping the data throughput um, pretty low. That's, you don't have to have huge, power-hungry, ABCs and DAX on both sides. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, so I think I loaded. We, I'm just uh, making sure that I didn't miss any pipeline block. Right, so if we have all that, then it's a matter of uh getting the data sets i already have the data set saved so let's see what i have here. Okay, all right, so have this over here. Creating a plain test split. And So now we simply call the pipe, the pipeline with the uh, uh, train data and test data and say whichever is the trainable uh, parameters, train parameters. And you can also save it to disk. But this one, you'll see that the entire pipeline is running. So the audio files are in a, in a HDFI file. That's been extracted and that's been loaded, and uh, feature extraction is happening on the entire data set. So MFCC is running. Uh, this is on the train data set at the moment. And that's on the test data set. And the mean and the normalization and access scaling and all that happens. So each of the pipeline blocks happens. And then finally, you have a uh, the training block executed. So we've uh, to recap what you what I've just done. I've built a a, a pipeline of different kinds of uh, processing blocks, each um, model modularized in a fashion that I want. So you can make it less or more modular if you want to 
uh, keep normalization and access scaling as part of each of extraction, that's fine. If you want to build up a pipeline of modular components, this is perfectly fine. And uh, the pipeline wrapper is a pretty thin wrapper around any kind of function that you want. So if you have a uh, essentially a binary written in C, C++, and if you just want to run that uh, on any stage of the pipeline, this is perfectly fine. You can uh, uh, you can just wrap it around a pipeline that processing and then create a pipeline like this. So if I have my own code that I would like to run on the low power CPU that is available on chip, is it possible? Uh, maybe I missed this step. Yeah, so it is uh, depending on how, uh, whether you have a kernel implemented for the block that you're uh, interested in. So the if you if you have that, then you can plug it in and the, you, we have an API to allow doing that as well. Okay, so you were talking uh, about offline and deploying of a custom pipeline, for instance, for feature extraction or uh, some pre-processing. Uh, uh, let's say you make the life of the developer easy into integrating some old C++ code in your uh, pipeline, in the, let's say, in the environment created by Talam, so that you can put it in your train pipeline without uh, getting mad or crazy yeah. or uh, something like that. Okay, okay. Yes, that, that, that is true, but also if you want to deploy it on uh, a, the local CPU and if you have a really optimized kernel implemented for, uh, for that uh, particular function, let's say, then if you just say run this on, on chip, the compiler can uh, somewhat um, take that and run it on chip. There's a, there's a, uh, uh, there's an API that you can use to allow the compiler to know that this needs to go on chip. Okay, okay, thanks. Okay. okay. So this is the, um, so we've gone from a simple network building to, uh, let's say a pipeline building stage and we have, um, so at this stage, uh, we we can even go further. So uh, we have the network, we have the pipeline, we have the mm -hmm. uh, compiler to run it on the chip. We have a, we, you can run it on the chip or the simulator, but Running each of these different pipeline stages at uh, you know every instance is also uh, not convenient. You might want to run just a few stages and stop there. Uh, maybe um, um, uh, maybe start from let's say a intermediate stage. This is also facilitated, and essentially uh, we are, we are now talking about integrating with MLOps tools. So if we were to talk about that, we can create something. So DVC is one of our uh, one of our chosen options for that. So you can create a DVC is data version control. It's a really nice tool to do um, this MLOps, you could say, versioning, tracking, hyperparameter mean, tuning. So you can generate the pipeline as a as a DVC pipeline. So whatever pipeline that you created, you can uh, create stages of um, a DVC pipeline from there. And once you do that, you can uh, you get all the power of DVC from there. So if I were to go to Fine. Uh, yeah, so you can essentially see, visualize what your pipeline would look like. Uh, need to run this again. Yeah, so feature extraction, feature mean normalization, 
all of that coming to plane, network test, network plane. This uh, entire pipeline can be built up and you can you can run each of them in a staged fashion. And then unless something has changed, you don't have to go back. Uh, you can start running the uh, pipeline from an intermediate stage. All of this is essentially you get it for free by just using BBC, but other MLOps tools can also probably do that. Um, so yeah, then if uh, it allows for hashing as well. So this is essentially um, you would, when you're running using BBC, depending on what the parameters of the pipeline are, you'd have a, a, a hash generated, an MD5 hash generated, and the pipeline would not rerun that if nothing has changed. If a parameter has changed or the data has changed or something like that, then you would rerun that part of the uh, pipeline um, and then have a new version of it. So that kind of version control and tracking uh, becomes possible. And we can also do uh, TensorFlow visualization. Mm. Opens up. Okay. Um, it says it's starting up, uh, so maybe it just takes a bit of, maybe a CPU is a bit stressed at the moment. Yeah. It is indeed, <laughs> because it's running it on the simulator. So, uh, what, uh, <clears throat> maybe I already said that they didn't have it. But what kind of neuron models are available in your hardware, for instance? What kind of leaf neuron model, uh, models are available? So, um, yeah, right now it's um, just leaf, but with configurable parameters. It, we, yeah, we don't do uh, fancy neurons normally for our standard architecture. Okay, because I think I saw some <clears throat> states associated to the synapses to uh, somewhere in the Python code, just with that. <clears throat> and then exponential here and there. And, and because usually in the literature, whenever you go analog, you see uh, people using adaptive uh, exponential uh, neurons and so on and so forth. That are supposed to be yeah. more powerful. Yeah, so okay. you get all your visualization schemes, all your confusion matrices, except for if I click on that, it should be able to. Yeah. And all this came for free as well by just having the, not for free, but because you set up, we set up a TensorBoard callback, um, get all that and penny accuracy. Right, so distributions, histograms of weights, whatever I plotted earlier. All, yeah, so all, the, all of this put together is basically around. Um, I think that's the, the summary of what Talamo is. And other questions at this point? There is a question from the chat. Uh, they are asking, is Talmo applicable to multi-channel audio regression, EE uh, speech enhancement in addition to audio classification? Yeah, so Talamo is, a, is, there isn't anything, uh, let's say custom about Talamo towards an application or even a chip. It's really a, a suite of tools to, build mm, pipelines where uh, one of the pipeline blocks is an SNN and to go deep onto uh, uh, how uh, configuring that SNN in a way you want. So 
the inputs can be as high dimensional as you want inside the while you're running things on software. It's only when you're trying to run uh, a particular pipeline on one of our hardware architectures that you might have to do some uh, cloning or reduction in dimensionality. Okay, thank you. Now, let me see if there were other questions. Uh, no. Mm -hmm. I have another question. Um, mm -hmm. Like uh, last, uh, like uh, some time ago, like I watched a super interesting uh, uh, talk by Bill Bradley, the CSO of NVIDIA, who who basically is trying to compute, uh, uh, compare different computing mechanisms. And uh, he says that analog is obviously very efficient in computing, but the problem really is the storage and the transfer. So can you say why... Um, how are you outperforming a, a digital system? Um, because you still have to, do you have to do ADC and DEC conversion from layer to layer? Like um, how do you deal with the, the quantization error and how can it be so efficient enough? Okay, so the, so I know, I know where you're coming from. I know that uh, this is a point of contention. How can you make sure the it is efficient enough? But again, our design philosophy has been that um, as long as end-to-end -end, um, you can show that a pipeline, um, an application can run and that uh, the, end, the system power of this end-to-end -end pipeline is low enough and you're within a certain bound for variability, then uh, in terms of performance, then you're uh, you're fine to from a customer point of view. So it how how that is done. Um, so this is for a series of different calibration uh, mechanisms, right? So both in terms of hardware and software, we have a bunch of uh, let's say calibration mechanisms that would optimize. Um, the performance, you could say. And for instance, I don't know if uh, this data is available, but uh, do you have some data from uh, even synthetic benchmarks on uh, your chips that can tell us, for instance, how many teraops per watt is able to perform, for instance, or something like that? I mean, uh, if I would like to know how efficient, for instance, on this uh, uh, your actual accelerator is, is there any data available from Inatera? Of course, feel free to say no, because you no, do not have a product out there yet, but uh, just just to get uh, some numbers uh, around in my head. So when you say um, benchmarks, this is again, this is, there's an actual activity called NeuroBench that we have, um, that's happening in the community, right? We are part of that. And we're part of both the algorithm stack and the system track. And we're trying to uh, work with the community there to put out some of these uh, numbers in, a, in an unbiased way, because it's very easy to just talk about the, let's say, the uh, inference power in the unlock domain or just, uh, you know, uh, average, out, average out power for a long enough period and show that our power numbers are low. So it's it's very difficult to come to a number like teraops for a metric like tops per watt. Um, so I think it, what I can say is uh, we, we can do an application like this, an audio application like this in, in uh, let's say, uh, single digit milliwatts. Uh, end to end and uh, uh, in uh, in processing, let's say one second per millisecond. Um, standard benchmarks, you'll have to wait for the uh, the system track coming from the neural bench effort. Okay, uh, so for instance, if we are taking this application, no, uh, 
how much uh, pico joules, nano joules uh, could I expect uh, expanding? If I want to attach, for instance, your ship to a battery, uh, and I want to do other classification on the edge. If the, for instance, of this application that you are running, how much can I expect to consume per inference, for instance? It, uh, <laughs> I don't think I can say a number. So as I said, it's a, you can think of it. Oh, as it's fine. It's fine if you, out. you can and, say, uh, you can say, I can't uh, answer yet. You can say yeah. that, don't worry. <laughs> You, uh, I don't want to get you fired just for a streaming on YouTube. No, absolutely, no, I'm joking. I'm joking, of course. But yeah, uh, yeah just uh, because I want to wrap up, uh, because uh, I came to Inatera, you know that I'm pretty digital guy. So when uh, it comes to hardware efficiency in the analog domain, I'm pretty, let's say, cautious. Yeah. Uh, with respect to the numbers so that's why i'm a really really curious at and i can't wait uh, uh for when uh this chip will be uh, uh, by the way is there uh, some uh, provision on when you will be able to deliver some uh, i don't know uh, evaluation kits uh, software development kits uh, even for some selected partners like a timeline or something yeah um so yeah that's why i was also putting up this slide which is uh i didn't see it sorry <laughs> yeah so we 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 have a partner program and uh, we have um uh, it's it's in a very early stage we're still assessing uh, whether there is interest and all that so if uh, if somebody is interested in uh getting a platform and with our sdk this is uh, we welcome uh, requests for that. We are prioritizing commercial partners, uh, obviously, uh, at this stage, but uh, on a case-to-case -case basis, we can also look at research uh, partners if, if it makes sense. So, so as a can... university, I can still get in touch and maybe ask uh, to buy some a kit or a couple of kits, for instance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. You can, uh, I can put you in touch with the... The business development team and then uh, we can have a discussion about that okay and as a timeline you said that uh, they are available basically or uh, there is a yeah so uh, there's a research partner for example who's working with one of our platforms so there's depending on uh, what level of uh, yeah features you want and all that we, can, we have different generations so we'll and just to conclude, so this is uh, so I was merely presenting the work from a bunch of different people. This is our uh, software and algorithms team. The software team is on the left. They uh, when they went go karting, I think, yeah, ice karting uh, once, and then you have the rest of the algorithms team on the right hand side. We have a fun bunch, I think. <laughs> so I can I can confirm I can confirm. <laughs> yeah, and we are hiring. So if any of you are uh, interested in joining us, uh, this is a plug. <laughs> okay. So, uh, uh, yeah. uh, are you going uh, to host also internships, for instance, for students or postgraduate? This is also on the table. We have uh, okay. quite a few. We had quite a few interns uh, from TU Delft, for example. A uh, few of them became our employees as well. So uh, this is perfectly fine. Or um, if you if you're in a PhD or something like that and would like to set up a a, a more longer, uh, let's say, a research collaboration, we can have a chat about that as well. Okay, thank you. Okay, yeah. So that is the that's all I had today. I hope that gave you a sense of what our stack is, and hopefully that also inspires a few of you to uh, fill the gaps in the open source domain of what software needs to be built to go from research SNNs to a, a full fledged application in embedded AI. Okay, thank you very much, George. Very nice, and thank let you. Me, let me check if uh, I don't see any questions and... Uh...
Yeah, I think that is it. All right. Thanks for having me. Perfect. Thank you very much, George. Have a nice evening. And thanks also to Inatera for presenting their product.